Hi, everybody. Hi. You guys sit a lot farther away than we do at Columbia, but we have a very uh, similar uh, table, but it's more rectangular. Yeah, thanks for, thank you guys for having me. Um, my name is Saad Haddad, composer at Columbia. Um, should be graduating sometime in May, hopefully, if they allow me to graduate. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. I was here, I think, pre-COVID as well, but I don't, reckon, I don't think I recognize anybody here. I was at the, um, the musicology conference. Uh, I did a paper on Vichnogratsky uh, for that conference. So I will have a slide about that actually later on uh, because his work, I'm very influenced by that and a lot of things that have to do with microtonality and um, these kind of things. So I'll, I'll get into that you know, as I go through. Um, I have to end it a little early, like around 1.20 or so, because I got to get back to New York, just so you know. But if you guys have questions, you can just feel free to ask. Like, I'm a very informal guy. I don't want this to be formal, uh, even though I'm wearing a dress shirt. <laughs> but uh, just, you know, if you have a question at any time, just ask away. Like, you know, I'm very open to that. So that's my website right there if you're interested to learn more. Um, so this is my background, just so you have an idea. I'm assuming a lot of you guys have a very similar background, too. I grew up in Los Angeles, and I stayed there for my undergrad. I went to the USC, uh, where I studied with all these folks. And uh, for my master's degree, I went to Juilliard, where I studied with Corleano and Mari Kimura. And then I stuck around New York, and I am doing my DMA at Columbia. As I said, my main advisor is uh, Georg Haas. So he's helping me out with my dissertation also. Some research interests. Like I mentioned, microtonality is a big one. but. Um, that stems from my integration of classical Arabic music with Western uh, traditional music. And I do that through spectral music, just intonation, electronics, uh, orchestration, that kind of thing. So these are the pieces that I have, like in this <laughs> document here. We're not going to go through all of them, but I just have them here just in case the conversation goes one way or the other. But I think a good piece to start out with is like a solo piece just because it's very easy to see what's going on I think. So this is my piece Vignettes from 2020 for solo piano with score to tour and it's about 10 minutes long. We're not going to listen to the whole piece but I just want to show you some of the ways that I use microtonality, use the makam which is the Arabic modes in my music, that kind of thing. The piece was commissioned by a young concert artist, uh, pianist Aristo Sham in December 2020 and it was streamed online. That was how the premiere was. I actually never heard the piece in person yet. It uses a score to piano, as I mentioned. These are the four pitches that are detuned down a quarter tone. Uh, if any of you know the, I'm assuming a lot of people here know the uh, Girard Grise Vortex Temporum piece, this is the same exact tuning system that I use. So the piece has never been played alongside Vortex Temporum, but that's kind of the idea that if someone is putting on Vortex Temporum, they could use this piece as an opening number. So that was my way of convincing young concert artists to detune one of the pianos because the, the pianist was, Aristo Sham was like playing Brahms and all this other stuff on the program and he had like a second piano just for my piece. So I had to do a lot of finagling to, to let me do that. The piece is called Vignettes. There are five of them. So the way that I structured the piece was I wanted to do like these two, like these five little miniatures. And later on, when I discuss another piece, you'll see how this actually, I got really lucky with the way I did the form for this piece when I go through another piece that is based on the same music. So my idea was like what, and with a lot of my music, I do, I do this kind of exercise. I think of, okay, what would like Ligeti do with Arabic Makam? What would Debussy do with Arabic Makam? What would Bach do with Arabic Makam? Like what would all these like Western composers do if they had like access to the Makam or where we're using it in an intentional way in their pieces. Ligeti is an interesting example because he actually did that with like African polyrhythm and the piano etudes. So there is kind of like a, there is kind of like a symbiotic relationship, I think, with the way I'm thinking about Arabic Makam and the way that Ligeti thinks about African polyrhythm. So there's this first movement here, which is all basically like percussive sounds. The second movement is basically all these kind of runs that just go straight up through the, through the piano. The third movement is based off of Debussy, like when you hear it, it's just like straight up Debussy <laughs> with a few like out of tune notes. And then the fourth movement is really like the like one of the Ligeti piano etudes where, you know, he kind of just plays on the piano and then releases a pitch every so often. And that's kind of the inspiration for that. And then the fifth movement, I took one of the Bach two part inventions and I just like completely changed the tuning, um, changed the macam or change the scale completely, I guess. And I changed the key as well for it to suit the low C quarter tone on the piano. 
So I'll just show you a little bit of what the beginning sounds like here. Okay, so the beginning is not much, but I'll, I'll play more of it. The main thing about the beginning here is that this F sharp is the first detuned note. But when you hear it, you don't know it's detuned because there's no, there's no uh, relative pitch, right? So you, I introduced this note and it happens to be the 11th partial of C. So I kind of do the whole resonance thing where I'm putting some notes down and then I release the 11th partial into the world, I guess, with this kind of thing. And then the, the rhythm itself is based off of um, some Arabic kind of rhythmic principles. So I'm trying to like condense all this stuff in a very Beethovenian way in like the first bar, like the rhythm, the pitches, the timbre. So all of that is like right here in, in the first bar. That's, that's what makes up the whole first movement here. And of course, this is the harmonic series. So I mean, I don't, I don't have to show this for you guys, but basically you, in the 11th partial of the, the C series, I'm using that here. And here's the second measure. So the second measure, it gets a little bit you intru I introduce more of the other pitches around the F sharp. So you hear the F sharp, okay, you don't know that it's a microtonal pitch, okay, fine. But then when you hear the G and you hear the E, now all of a sudden you hear that the F sharp is out of tune, right? And the thing about it is that the purple box here, that denotes the first three notes of Jin's Bayati in E. So Jin's Bayati, the way that it's structured is that you have E, F half sharp, G, and then it just keeps going up the scale. So let me show you what that sounds like. And the reason you didn't hear the F sharp here is because it's, it's, he's holding it down here. So very ligety kind of style where, you know, he's playing a G, F sharp, E, this whole grace note passage, but you don't hear the F sharp in that particular uh, area there. So here's Jin's Bayati, the first four notes. And then I do it more in the context of Arabic music. So it's not enough for me to just use the notes, but I'm also trying to remove the, at least in this piece, remove some of the aesthetic principles of how they use Jin's Bayati in their music. Because if I just use Jin's Bayati in their way in Western music, I don't think that's really enough. I really need to change the aesthetics of how that uh, music is being used within my personal language. So that's why I included that like last improvisation because like that is not what my piece sounds like at all, right? So I think that's, that's really important that it has to do more with aesthetics. So here in this, the next two measures, so basically I'm like introduce, like I'm unfolding the piece, measure one, measure two, measure three, four, five, et cetera. So I hope it's not too didactic, but it, it gives you a really clear sense, I think, of like how I think about my language. So here in this green box, I introduced the entire series. So the whole octave of E by Atti. So the first, the measure before it was like the first three or four notes, and now it's the whole thing. But I do it in clusters instead of hearing the whole scale. So again, it's like the, that, it, the aesthetics of the Arabic music is completely not there, but all the notes are there. And here is an example of that. In the next slide here, I introduce the next note down. So if you remember, it's F sharp, A, D sharp, C. So now I introduce the second uh, squirtator note, which is this A. It loosely translates to the seventh partial of, of the B series, but I'm using quarter tones, so it's not really, it's not exact, but it's the concept of using the seventh partial of the B series that interests me the most. So there's the A right there, and then the B series is kind of, the resonance of the B, of the B chord is, is on the bottom there. And this is kind of 
This is the new macam I'm using based off of using that A. So now I chose the macam that has the F sharp and the A in, in the same uh, mode. And now I'll just play like the first 30 bars or so of this so you get an idea. And this is the second, second little vignette. Now I show you all this because I think it's important to showcase like how this translates to orchestral writing. Because the scordatura kind of stuff and, and trying to be, I mean it's not the most experimental music in the world, I know that, but when you apply it to an orchestra, it's a lot more difficult to get some of these things out and translate it for a larger ensemble. So uh, this kind of happened by accident. I didn't mean for this to happen, but there was this opportunity that I saw with the, with the Orchestra Nationale de la France, and they had this really strange competition. Like, it's one of these competitions you see that you, like, you look at it and you're like, I'll never, like, why would I apply to this? It's like, it's so ridiculous. But for me, it, it like matched exactly what I wanted to do with this solo piano piece. So the, the query was, um, I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't know if any of you have seen it on the Ulysses website, but it was like, you need to write two two-minute movements of a piece for piano and orchestra. And based off of that, we will select four finalists to write the other three movements. And the piece can only be 10 minutes long. If you remember, this thing, is literally that. <laughs> it's five movements, two minutes each for piano. So what I basically did was for the contest, I took the first two vignettes and I orchestrated them. And uh, obviously I had to remove the score to Torah, but now I have an orchestra. I can put those pitches in the other uh, instruments. And I had to change some things around for this to work well. So I wanna actually play you this whole piece. It's only 10 minutes long and I'll play you the orchestral version. So what you'll see is I use the exact same kind of form but what I decided to do for the orchestral version is not play this fifth vignette. So what I actually do is instead of the fifth vignette, I actually go back to the first vignette and I just reorchestrated it because I didn't think the fifth vignette translated well at all to orchestra. So I, it, you'll hear the first four and then you'll hear it circle back to the first one, but with a different orchestration. So I want to play you actually that whole recording.
can see why I chose to end it with the first movement reorchestrated. I thought it would be a better orchestral ending that way than ending it with like a two-part Bach convention that I wouldn't have known how to orchestrate anyway. <laughs> Okay, so here's another, again, related to everything that you've seen so far, but now it's for a string quartet. So this is my second string quartet, uh, commissioned by the Caramore Center for Music and the Arts, and played by the Callisto Quartet. So with this piece in particular, I wanted to do something that was, that took the form from uh, Nicola Vincentino. So he's like, I don't know if you know about this, uh, he's a music theorist from the 15th century uh, Rome. He basically wanted, was one of these pioneers like Gesualdo and all those kind of folk that uh, figured out a way to uh, incorporate the 31 uh, tone equal temperament system. And he made this amazing like organ uh, back then that was re that, that's now like reconstructed in Switzerland uh, at this place called Studio 31. And uh, so what I tried to do was kind of recreate one of the choral works that Vicentino wrote that was part of this big treatise uh, that was published back in the in the 1500s. So, what you'll see is the piece uh, Musica Prisca Caput uh, from the treaties is organized into three parts. So the first part, the orange part here, it's all uh, diatonic. So it's like all the white notes basically. And then the green part here, he calls it um, chromatic area. So he uses basically all the you know, 12 12 uh, pitches from you know, the 12 equal temperament system. And then the interesting part comes at the end where he introduces what he calls the enharmonic section, where he introduces uh, the, basically the, not quarter tones exactly, but based off of this uh, 31 tone equal, uh, equal temperament system. So it's really interesting because you can like hear the progression in one piece, and this piece is very short. It's like, it's like less than three minutes maybe. So I really like it because for me, when I think about microtonality, I want it to be an experience that feels like a language in of itself. I'm not using it to create dissonance in, in a kind of noise parameter. And it's also not this way of like, not directly at least creating like a resonance chamber like you would in like spectral, like French spectral music and that kind of thing. It's something else. And I, and I feel like it has more to do with uh, what Vichnogratsky was doing in the beginning of the 21st century when he was actually trying to relate the 24 tone equal temperament system to functional harmony. So I'm trying to do something similar to that, but using the Arabic maqam as my pitch like resource, if that makes sense. So this was very inspiring for me when I saw this, uh, well, when I heard this piece. So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So very similarly to the way the vignette started, it, it's, it's a very kind of similar thing, the Beethovenian thing where everything is kind of introduced in the beginning here. So here I introduce the D Ross set, which is D, you'll see on the bottom here, D, E, F, half sharp, G, and A. Um, so let me show you what that sounds like here. And I start to bring in the aesthetics of Arabic music a little bit, but only in the way the grace notes are applied. So uh, here with the blue boxes, these are what I call slash grace notes that are before the beat. So these slash grace notes here, here are, come right before the quarter rest. And then these green boxes here are the unslashed grace notes. They occur on the beat. And you can see that there's like this rest here that's denoting where you should play that. So it's just, it's just a little bit of an introduction of the aesthetics of Arabic music in terms of where do these grace notes go. I mean, these are not things that you don't see in Western music, but I'm doing it in such a way where I'm making it very intentional. Okay, like this is one kind of ornament you can create. This is another kind of ornament that's possible in the piece, uh, et cetera. And then uh, just to show you a different part of the piece here, this is later on in the piece where I'm using I'm like, like literally creating chords here. So I mean, I could, I could sit here and like actually analyze C, B diminished six, five, C, C, and then I do the C overtone chord, and then it keeps going back between C, B, uh, C and B. And these chords, I took them from the Vicentino piece. So in the middle section of the Vicentino piece that's chromatic, you get the C, B, C kind of progression. So I just literally borrowed that and then put my own language on top of that. So 
So you're still getting those grace notes from the beginning, but now it's obviously in a lower, you know, lower on the strings instrument. You got all four of them, and then we're introducing like actual, you know, functional <laughs> uh, uh, tertian chords here. Then in the last part of, of the Vicentino piece, we introduce the actual the quarter tones basically, and I approximated them as quarter tones in my piece. So this is a reduction of one of the cadences in the third part of Musica Prisca Caput. And there's many, many cadences and progressions that are based off of this. So basically, I mean, if we didn't have the half sharps, this would just be a really easy, you know, perfect authentic cadence, right? But with the half sharps introduced, you got the C major, but all, all the pitches are up a quarter tone. You get this like completely new sensation, which I wanted to use uh, in my piece. Play that again for you, just it was so short. sounds a lot better obviously when the singers are doing it but it's just like really magical because you you hear these five one cadences going on but you know there's something off but uh, especially after you heard the first two sections which are which don't have any microtones at all so it's it's just a really amazing sensation when you get to that uh, spot and i really also like that it doesn't really have anything to, to do with with just intonation or or spectral music in a direct way like it's a different way of thinking about uh, microtones that i think uh, than I think what is the norm. So here is how I interpreted that. So instead of going from C to F, which is not a very friendly key, I think, on strings, I just moved it up to D and G. So we have D half sharps and then a G chord. And the G is nice because I can use open strings. So the tuning is, is really easy once we get to that. They just got to worry about all this stuff before. So here's that, what this sounds like. So hopefully you can, the, the sensation is hopefully pretty similar between that and this, but that's exactly what I wanted to do there. And then I wanted to show you a little bit, I think this is fun, so just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from with the Vichnagratsky. This is part of the presentation I gave uh, when, I was, when I was here last time, so let me just show you this. Basically, to me, this ninth prelude of Vichnagratsky, which is part of this big, huge 24 prelude set uh, for a quarter tone, two, two pianos, one of them is down a quarter tone. To me, it, so it sounds exactly like this, uh, basically, the same kind of sensation. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of the rhythm, in terms of the harmony, like all of it, like uh, to me, like I'm directly inspired by this kind of thinking of like how to take the, especially the Western repertoire and like completely transform it into, into something like uh, something very personal, at least to me. So I feel like this part of my string quartet especially is very directly, you know, a result of, of that sort of thinking. But I did it with the Vicentino instead of the Chopin. So... This kind of culminates uh, into this piece. So all the stuff that I'm talking about pretty much culminates with this piece, Arwa, which means souls in Arabic. So this is like one of my newer pieces from 2022. Uh, it was premiered by the International Contemporary Ensemble back in April and scored for this kind of, you know, mixed octet uh, 
probably the most interesting thing about this is that the, there's a tam-tam in it and only a tam-tam, uh, but it's not really, it's not used like a tam-tam. I, it, I use this like steel wool sponge basically uh, throughout the piece, so it's almost like you don't even hear a tam-tam. But um, the important thing to say about this piece is that it's, it's the first time I wrote a piece that was a response to something that happened in the world. So obviously, you know, with the COVID situation, I mean, we were all affected by it. So I thought it was appropriate for me to write uh, my COVID piece because, I mean, I was affected as well, right? So I had like very strong ideas about what I would do. So uh, throughout the piece, there's a lot of breath sounds. And I was thinking, you know, about death and that kind of, I don't usually think about death at all, really, but uh, um, and, and not in my pieces either. But this piece, I was really thinking about about that and about the breath and I, like, and, and more specifically about what is the last breath like, you know, that we as humans will take, like what, what is that experience like? And that's like where I centered my attention on, on that kind of thought. So you'll see and hear a lot of breathing sounds from the orc, from the, from the ensemble, the, and the, the, the string instruments are actually wearing masks. So uh, I think that, you know, that intensifies the effect a little bit. And then the, the steel wool on the tam-tam is also doing that kind of breath kind of sound. And of course, you know, with the wind instruments, very easy to do that too. I mean, with the wind kind of sounds, but there are parts of the piece where, you know, they're doing high, mid, low frequency breath sounds. Um, so if you have the score up on your laptops, you could see it a lot more clearly. Um, I'm gonna show you a video um, of the performers. I think that makes more sense uh, in this context. And um, there are parts of the piece, there's a middle section of the piece that uses string multiphonics. First time I did that, and that also coincides with the breath idea. So that's one part of it, the breath, okay, fine. We get it, you know, the programmatic part of it. Uh, and then there's the musical part of it. And my question with this piece is, you know, how could I actually tackle harmony in a more uh, personal way and not just kind of like borrowing functional harmonic principles from Vicentino and, Chopin and uh, you know all these Debussy and all these other you know very you know kind of super traditional things. So I really try to push myself to figure out like what other kinds of combinations of pitches can I can I get that are and I have to be honest, a lot of them were done <laughs> kind of uh, you know without really a system because I was trying to get away from that a little bit more with this piece. So that's that's the other big part of it like how to create like a harmony with the with this macam mindset this is the video of the actual performance
I mean, it's really hard to imagine because for me, um, it's hard to explain too because I try to make it more like, uh, it's because like when when I talk to Haas about like making music, he's very like Georg Haas. He's like very about it being a spiritual experience, and he really treats it that way, like going to church, that kind of thing. And I never really approached music that way. Like when I'm writing music, I'm very like systematic, and like I'm trying to get a certain number of bars done a day and that kind of thing. And you know, like that's that's all fine and good for meeting deadlines and stuff, but it's not that great when you're trying to get out of yourself. So I really tried my best to like not have like anything in front of me or like not even think about like a particular composer and just see what happens when I do that. I think that was the, that was step number one. Like just get out. I like knowing that there was influence, like you could hear, I mean, you hear spectral chords in there, you hear cadences, like you hear all that stuff, but it's not like something that I, I just had like a score of something. I'm like, all right, I see that. Let me see if I can take that. And, and transform it in my way. No, I, I decided not to do that at all. Like, let me see what would happen if I just came up with something from scratch. Um, so with this piece, what I could say is, um, I do have something more specific I could say that how I started thinking about that is, um, if you take a look at the score here, the first part of the piece, that melody that plays, that's the first thing I wrote. And my idea was, my first question to get to lead into the harmony was what if I wrote something was that was aesthetically exactly like an Arabic taksim, like an Arabic improvisation, like exactly the same kind of thing with the ornamentation, the range of rhythms, the introduction of rhythmic material that gets reintroduced later on. Like what if I did exactly that, but the pitches are my pitches. So these pitches are not part of any makam. I just made them up, <laughs> you know. It's like a Lou Harrison sort of like fantasy scale kind of thing. It's not a real scale. But the aesthetics of the ornamentation, the rhythm are from Arabic taksim. So that was my first question. And then I said, okay, great. I have all these pitches that are like not really part of the Arabic scales. Is there some kind of harmony that I can make out of that instead of like trying to fit the maqam onto a harmony? So that like broke me out of it because before I was like, all right, I have the E by Atti scale. Let me see what kind of chords I can make out of that. And that was, that was limiting me a lot, I thought, because I kept making the same chords uh, over and over and the same clusters and the same progressions. So when I like made up the pitches myself, but then kept the aesthetics of the rhythm and the phrasing, which is like the opposite of what I did with those other pieces, I took the aesthetics out those aesthetics out of the piece for the most part and kept the pitches like it freed me a lot in terms of deciding what pitches to use so like when you get further on the rhythm gets slower and slower in time so then you're left with the same pitches but now they're in quarter notes all together so it's like whatever the harmonies are are what the harmonies are if that makes sense so by the time you get here and these notes here and these notes here like these this collection of pitches doesn't really have an intrinsic relationship. The intrinsic relationship is that you heard them as a melody here before. So I think that's like the most cogent way I could say it, if that makes sense. I think a lot of the eclecticism, so like my, my background is pretty varied. Like I went to Juilliard for my master's, which was like super traditional, um, you know, conservatory training. And, and my teacher was John Corleano. And like in his symphonic work, like everything is very eclectic like that. He would have a tango in one area and then a march somewhere else. And then, uh, you know, he would be quoting you know, older music or he'd be quoting like stuff that's not like popular music and things like that. He'd just be very eclectic. And I, and I like that a lot. but. I didn't know how that would fit into my music. So I think that is inspired a lot by studying with him, the eclectic part of it. And then, you know, going to Columbia, this is like, to me, my Columbia piece, you know, like uh, inspired by everyone there that's really into this kind of, uh, this kind of stuff with microtonality and really focusing on the sound more so than focusing on how you relate to the tradition. And I think that's what my studies with, at Juilliard were more like, like how do I relate to the tradition? Uh, I don't know if that answers the question directly, but. Um, it's interesting because like when Georg talks about spirituality to me, and, and I, not to bore you with this, but I have a chapter of my dissertation, which I just finished. It's called Tarabic Harmony. And Tarab means musical ecstasy in Arabic. 
So my idea was like, what if you, instead of focusing on harmony, like the pitches themselves, like ex uh, focus on the experience of, again, that goes back to aesthetics, the experience of, of spirituality, of ec uh, musical, uh, like ecstasy, as I mentioned. So I focused more on that. Like, how do I achieve that in the music? Because I think Haas does the same thing in his music. He, he strives for that like level of like you get into the the music and you can't like get out of it. You can't get out of and you and you buy it. You buy into whatever sounds he's giving you. And I really like that because uh, in Arabic music it's the same thing. When you when you see like a traditional Arabic um, takt play, which is like an ensemble, traditional ensemble with a singer in front of it, like the you can tell when you're uh, that the audience is like mesmerized and they they're clapping at the right points. They're screaming at the and you know, exalting at the right points um, that only they really know. And I really like that kind of feeling. So instead of focusing on like pitches and relating it to something like I have, like I was doing with the string quartet and the piano piece, I focused more on the, like that spirituality aspect or like, like how can I recreate that, that kind of feeling that these people have like, in my music. Uh, I don't know, day by <laughs> day. By day. I, I mean, it, it, it's easy to talk about now, I guess, now that it's done, but I just thought, I just had that front of mind, if that makes sense. Like, if I have it front of mind, it is more likely to happen. Whereas if I had Debussy front of mind, that's more likely to happen. If that, I mean, you can only focus on so many things when you're writing music. I mean, as you guys know, it's like uh, very exhausting. So I made sure that that spiritual aspect was like front of mind when I was, especially in the introduction of the piece. Yeah, and I can attribute that to Haas, for sure. That wasn't something I got from Corleano as much. Uh, this might sound really simplistic, but um, I'm just going to say it. I don't use the quarter tone interval, really, at all. So I, at a lot of micro, so what I mean by that, in a lot of microtonal music I hear, it's, it's all about the quarter tone interval, like literally. He C, C half sharp and over and over again, and clusters and that kind of thing. And that's what the music is about. But I purposefully avoid that. So a lot of my music it uses the three quarter tone uh, interval as the basis. And I think that when you do that, you're avoiding that whole idea of pitting C against C half sharp, for example. You're, you're, by doing C and then you know, D half flat, like right after it, for example, you are like introducing a level of ambiguity. Uh, like, oh, is that D? What is that D? You know? But if you put C and C half sharp right next to it, you hear the beating uh, immediately. I mean, it's like apparent. But C and D half flat, if you play those, two, especially on a string instrument, the beating is not as apparent when you play those two next to each other. And same thing with, uh, uh, so C and D half flat is one example. Also C and E half flat, uh, like the third, the neutral third, that also has that same kind of absence of, of beating sensation. And I. That's really important because I think it's that, that it's taking out the consonance factor. I think when you introduce the consonance factor, again, it's not a C and E, like it's not a C major chord, but it's something else, but it still feels consonant. So there's that relationship of consonance and dissonance. I think that makes a difference. And then the other thing is, uh, this is from Vichnagrotsky, which is, it's in my dissertation too. Um, it's, it's pretty funny. He has this, uh, it's also a perception thing because Vichnagrotsky, he has this bit in, the, in his manual he has a treatise that talks about um, how to use like functional chords uh, with this 24 tone system. He has a part of it that says quarter tones like C, C half sharp, that interval, could be used as a really great ornament, ornamentation, like a really good ornament. You should use quarter tones as ornaments and you should avoid the three quarter tone interval at all costs as an ornament, <laughs> which I think is hilarious because I do the exact opposite. And I, I feel exactly the opposite about that perception. It, like when I read that, I just, I just laughed. I, you know, I just couldn't believe it because you know, I agree with him on many other things, but with that, I absolutely did not agree with that at all, that the quarter tone interval is a better ornament than the three quarter inter interval. So yeah, that's how I approach it. Uh, freedom really to me means not worrying about what, other, what anyone is, thinks about, about what I'm doing. That's freedom. Because there's all this stuff about appropriation going on. I mean, this is a different topic. But to me, you know, when you, when you put that sort of limitation on yourself, there's, I feel like any sort of limitation like that, it, it, it stifles creativity. 
And, uh, you know, for me, like, I am not, you know, I wasn't born in the Middle East. I, my parents were born there, but, like, I, I barely know the language. I can't read or write, but I really love the music, you know. But if you're going to look at the definition of appropriation, maybe, you know, my, maybe I'm an example of that. I don't know. Uh, but I don't worry about it because I, I love the music. So uh, in terms of freedom, that's, like, one of the things I think about, like, not worrying about what anyone thinks about what I'm doing because I just love doing it. So that's like top of mind, like don't care about what, what other people think about what I'm doing, um, you know, from especially the non-musical aspects of what I'm doing. Because when you hear on the surface level, it's like, okay, it's another composer that's doing like these, this mashup of like in the Eastern, Western stuff. Like, but I, I, try, I get, try to get past that like surface level tokenism of what I'm doing and, and just worry about what parts of the aesthetics and the music I'm interested about the most. So that's, that's freedom for me.